Don't dare to extend this plant's license by even as much as one year. No nukes, no nukes. Vermont Yankee just has to go right now. No nukes, no nukes. Vermont Yankee just has to go. Yes, energy promises safety, but sometimes their sirens don't blow. And strontium leaks are polluting, so Vermont Yankee just has to go. No nukes, no nukes. Vermont Yankee just has to go right now. No nukes, no nukes. Vermont Yankee just has to go. The plant is a terrorist target. Why not use much less toxic fuels? Choose hydro and solar and wind farms. Make safe those nuclear waste pools. Join us. Shut it down, oh, shut it down. Vermont Yankees unsafe, we know, we know. Shut it down, shut it down. Vermont Yankee just has to go. All right. <laughs> We're the Raging Grannies, and we're here to take a stand against the senseless killing raging in Afghanistan. From Haiti to the Middle East, in each and every land, we sing to end all war. No more military action. We declare dissatisfaction with greedy politicians who make war with bombs and guns. We rage to end all war. They tell us to be quiet and they throw us into jail. But though we're old, we're feisty and we're anything but frail. With songs for peace and justice, now our message will prevail. We sing to end all war. No more military we are raging at our nation for spending all our taxes to destroy, exploit, and kill. We rage to end all war. Oh. you want to take one more as we get done? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, oh, to black corporations? Yeah. Okay. Okay. For a grand finale. <laughs> Corporations are persons now. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. One, two. Bribery, bribery. Now is the law of the land. Corporations doing what once was banned. The Supreme Court set a precedent. Now Walmart can be president, because business has rights, and to their delight, corporations are persons now. Fair campaigning now is a thing of the past. Those with money own the elections at last. They'll buy all the TV at time and run their swift vote as slime. They offer no proof to hell with the truth. Corporations are persons now. Let's get out and fight with all of our might and do what we know is right. First of all, we want to thank First Churches for inviting us to be here and allowing us to use this space. So let's hear it for First Churches. Cecile's book tour was conceived of and executed through the Nuclear Free Future Coalition. Um, we looked in our treasury one day and there was enough money to fly Cecile out. So we said, when we were thinking about what to do for Hiroshima Day this year, it's perfect. We need to bring together the issue of nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and who better to do it than Cecile? It was a no-brainer, and we all just smiled and said, here we go. So uh, 
The Nuclear Free Future Coalition meets in the American Friends Service Committee here on Tucon Street, and it's comprised of the American Friends Service Committee, Arise for Social Justice, Citizens Awareness Network, Grace Church Episcopal Peace Fellowship, Haydenville Congregational Church Peace and Justice Steering Committee, the New England Peace Pagoda, Northampton Committee to Stop the War, Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice, and Physicians for Social Responsibility. I hope I haven't left anybody out, but those are the people we've been uh, meeting for three years now, over three years, and um, working on how do we create a nuclear-free future. Uh, that's our uh, mission. A nuclear free future, both uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, back and forth. Um, so, it, to introduce Cecile, uh, Cecile has had a long history of anti-war activism and is a noted, gifted author. When words started seeping out about the Fukushima catastrophe in March 2011, Cecile lost no time in deciding she had to write this story. Despite a serious fall that resu resulted in a broken ankle and a car accident, 80-year-old Panetta decided not only would she write this searing denunciation of the worldwide nuclear industry, energy industry, a minutely detailed day-by-day -day expose of what amounts to humanity's death wish. That was written by John Nichols. But she would have it published and on the streets by March 11, 2012, the one-year anniversary of Fukushima. She did it. that went into this book. And somehow, she did all that, and she wrote this beautiful manifesto and uh, diary and lots of things we could call it. Jeff Biggers of Huffington Post calls this, quote, one of the most important and required reads this year, an unremittingly courageous, if not prophetic, voice. And I would say it's all of that. People that have read it are shaking their heads <laughs> yes and agreeing. I would like to give a round of applause to Cecile, who has journeyed east from her home in Berkeley, California, to take us on her journey, and quote, one which reflects both the vision at the core of the nuclear process and its fragmenting effects on our minds and lives, according to Joanna Macy. Let's give her a standing ovation, Cecile. Stand. I want to thank every one of you for coming out on this beastly hot night and 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 sweating with me. <laughs> and uh, it's really wonderful that you're here. And I want to especially thank all the extraordinary work that went into creating this occasion. Before we start, it's very hot. And people are still, I know I am, still digesting. Um, so what I want to ask you is, uh, we've heard from most of the people in this room about why you came here tonight. And so what I'd like to ask is for a minute of silence to focus us, to reconnect, with why we're here.
Now, just reflect. If we were to add all the years of all the activism of all the people in this room, we might have more than a thousand years, you know? There are people who have been active for 60 or 70, 80 years of their lives. So, before I start, I want to thank you, because that's the serious work, not this book. That's the serious work. So, thank you. And so I just want to say a few preparatory remarks uh, about uh, what I had in mind with this book. Um, this is one of the outcomes that I hoped this book would help all of us to achieve, to understand that we need to achieve. I'll pass this around so you can see it. But this is uh, an article from the New York Times about the demonstrations that are taking place every, every Friday night in Tokyo. And over 200,000 people turn out. Now, if you know the Japanese personality, you know that Japanese people tend to be extremely compliant and very polite. So it's very, very hard for them to make waves. And guess what? The same thing applies here for different cultural reasons. But I've been talking to Hadi and other people, and I think that the time to be polite is over. I think that we have to say it as it is. And so one of the agendas with this book is to say it like it is. So if you'd like to start that passing around. So that was the first objective, writing this book. Obviously, the second one must be clear to you. Uh, to me, the magnitude of this event is so horrendous in terms of its implications for our planet, our Mother Earth, that I truly needed to do this work in order to wrap my small brain around the magnitude of this event and to try to understand how it all feeds in to every one of the causes that all of us are working for. And I'll be talking about that in the process of this talk. Now, there's one more thing uh, about my agenda. As you know, there's no point in talking about catastrophe or potential catastrophe unless we make it clear what are the stakes. What are the stakes? Otherwise, we don't earn it. It becomes just a bunch of sentimentality. So one of the things that I really wanted to do is to create a pay-in to this planet in praise of the planet, in praise of our Mother Earth. So for those of you who will read the book or who have read it, you will see that it's a multiplicity of voices. It doesn't come out of nowhere. My work has been going from lone, struggling protagonists to discovering the collective voice, and now all the voices that are here in this book, including two George Carlin impersonations. I won't treat you to them tonight unless you get me drunk. <laughs> so you will hear uh, stuff tonight uh, that some, very few, because I think most of you really are, are on message now. But you will hear things that are deeply, deeply disturbing. And I would ask you, if you can't hear them tonight, I hope you'll hear them tomorrow. <clears throat> so for those of you who want to follow, this is section 123 on page 189. And, uh, its title is Waiting for the Other Shoe. At the time of the earthquake of March 11th, which destroyed all six GE Mark I boiling reactors, Unit 4 was being refueled. 
Refueling procedure requires that the core be raised to the level five stories above ground where the stored fuel pool is located. Note the brilliance of that design, okay? <laughs> Reports began to surface as early as December 5th that Unit 4 had lost its south side wall. On December 2nd, beside Reactor 4, something like fire was observed on camera. Since then, a strong light has been set towards the Fukuichi webcam as if to hide something by whiteout. But what? In an interview with Tom Hartman, Paul Gunter, director of Beyond Nuclear's Reactor Oversight Project, stated, quote, Unit 4 is looking more and more like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The whole building is structurally listing. The full core was offloaded to the cooling pool during refueling, and the building is now shifting. Tokyo Electric Power Company has been sending engineers in there to try and shore it up with poles, with poles, and bobby pins, and whatever to keep it from falling over. Quote, and this is a quotation from Akio Matsumura. If the fuel rods spill onto the ground, disaster will ensue and contaminate Tokyo and Yokohama, creating a gigantic evacuation zone. All scientists I talked with say that if the structure collapses, we will be in a situation well beyond where science has ever gone. The destiny of Japan will be changed, and the disaster will certainly compromise the security of neighboring countries and the rest of the world in terms of health, migration, and geopolitics. Simply stated, according to Matsumura, Tokyo and Yokohama will become uninhabitable zones <coughs> for all eternity, or 4.5 billion years, whichever comes first. So I want to stop there just for a moment and tell you that in California recently, we had the visit of Chico Shina. Chico Shina is here in this book. She is a, an anti-nuclear activist now because she started life as a, as a political activist. She's not the traditional Japanese housewife by any means. But she started, essentially, as an activist in an urban setting. And she decided, when she was in her 40s, that she really was not happy with um, being embedded in the, in, the, uh, in the capitalist way of life. And so she bought a spread in Fukushima Prefecture to begin an uh, organic farm. And she was so successful that uh, she was able to build out buildings uh, on the spread where people all over the world came to learn her methods and what she was doing. And she spoke to us in Japanese with a simultaneous interpreter. And what she said was, on March 11th, 2011, I lost my land. I lost my livelihood. I lost my way of life. I lost my life. And we need to think about this because you're here in an area where there's a reactor that is exactly the same model as the GE Mark I. As you probably know, it was designed defective. Three uh, design engineers quit rather than sign off on it. One of them, Dale Breidenbaugh, called it 10 pounds of energy in a five pound sack. You are living with this peril every day that you draw breath here. And I'm sure those of you who have lived here all your lives are completely embedded in your landscape. Okay, this is the soil. This is what we're talking about, this stuff. This, this stuff. And it's the attachment to that. Because all of us, if you think about it, if I were to ask you now, just take a moment and think, what would you call your landscape? if you could claim it. 
And I can tell you that for me, there's a section in here about Fire Island because I grew up on the Atlantic uh, seaport. And I adore the dunes and sand and the Atlantic. I just, you know, we have a Pacific, but, you know, it just can't hold a candle to the Atlantic, I have to tell you. No, there's something just extraordinarily ferocious about the Atlantic. A feeling, see, it's called the Pacific. It's quite peaceful compared to the Atlantic. But we know that the Atlantic can be really ferocious. So I want you to think about your landscape and what it means to you. Um, how am I doing time wise? You're good. All right. So how much more time do we have? Uh, 15 minutes and 10 minutes of questioning. Good. All right. So I'm going to read to you uh, a, uh, section that is very personal to me. Um, and uh, I mean, I feel that I have your permission to do this tonight. There are times when one encounters a voice so deeply unsettling, this is page 143, that it throws the assumptions of one's lifetime into question. Perhaps that is what people call a crisis of conscience, brought on in my present case by encountering John Goffman's curious little book, An Irreverent Illustrated View of Nuclear Power. His main point is that nuclear energy quite simply equals murder. From its first extraction from the earth in the form of uranium and the radon gas the mining process releases, nuclear technology causes death. Initially, to the unfortunate miners who work in the uranium mines, for them, they may not be another choice possible because work in the mines has a high probability of causing cancer or lung disease. On some level, I knew that Certainly by the time in 1989 when with a friend I traveled the Southwest, I remember passing a passing conversation in some deserted alley where outside her doorway a Pueblo woman was shaking out a rug. I must have asked her what work her husband did. He worked in the uranium mines. I asked her did he wear a respirator, use protective gear. She told me no. He wasn't given any safety equipment. I remember telling her that she should make sure that he had a respirator. So on some level, I do, but I failed to feel. I failed to question. I accepted uranium extraction as a given. Ultimately, I failed to make the quantum leap that as a subscriber, I used electricity that in some part, at least, came from a process that accepted that people would have to die. Besides the miners who extracted ore and released uh, radon into the atmosphere, there would be death attendant on the people milling the ore, refining and manufacturing fuel rods, nuclear plant workers consigned to working with highly lethal substances, ultimately affecting their health. I fail to understand that each year a nuclear plant operates. It essentially is bombing the earth by generating nuclear waste that can never be stored safely that in one year, a 1,000 megawatt plant generates waste the equivalent of 100 Hiroshima bombs, that in one year, the 104 plants operating in continental United States are bombing the earth at least 10,400 times, and that the over 400 nuclear plants worldwide are bombing the earth 41,600 times, and that in the approximately 40 years after which their containment vessels become dangerously brittle, unable to withstand a serious challenge without failing, as we saw at Fukushima, the Earth will have been bombed 1,640,000 times. That's over 1,640 nuclear bombs. And that already, in this half cycle of our nuclear existence, the energy half. It will have resulted in millions of deaths of cancer and leukemias, not only of the working population that feeds this process, but also of the countless people who happen to live downwind where these plants routinely release plumes of radioactive steam and where accidents ranging from relatively minor to major ones, such as Three Mile Island, consistently occur. 
And that is only half the Janus phase of the nuclear cycle. The more obvious war-making cycle is the war phase, Gog, to electricity's Magog. Goffman's book was published at the height of the Cold War in 1979, while the Three Mile Island catastrophe was still ongoing. In those years, the public conversation centered around mutually assured destruction, the use of the big bombs, the ICBMs that would be fired from underground silos. It was taken as a given that if such weapons were made, they would eventually be used. We will not have a nuclear war. Now, I want to stress this. We, we will not have a nuclear war. We are already having a nuclear war, right now. From the time the United States gave depleted uranium to Israel in 1982 for use in Lebanon, DU has contaminated irreversibly and for all eternity the soils of Kosovo, Iraq, Gulf Wars 1 and 2, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, and wherever else the U.S. and its NATO surrogates have applied it. Why wait for the big bombs when they can be dropped in the form of bite-sized pieces to even more devastating effect? And don't forget that among the populations that have been severely affected by this nuclear, this non-nuclear nuclear war, is our returning civil, uh, 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 military personnel. They're coming back with a thing called gulf disease. Now, why do you think the Pentagon calls it gulf disease? Because it is radiation sickness. They don't want you to know that. In my own gradual awakening, I have come at last to realize that for a great part of my life, I too have lived without a navel, That's, that is, without connection to the earth, okay? I have lived without a navel, without giving full weight to my own attachment to the earth, to the sanctity of all life on earth, and to the earth itself. It has been a ponderously slow awakening. Having gained some perspective at last on 65 years of my own deep moral abdication, I am left with a feeling of disgust at my failure to ask the questions that might have dispelled my own despicable vacancy an awful lot sooner. Quote, there is no free lunch, unquote, writes William Hendy. Quote, if you want nuclear technology, some people are going to have to die. So uh, I think uh, time is fleeting, and we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to participate here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to the end. I'm going to read you the last section of this, well, next to the last section of this book. It's section 129 on page 201. And I'm referring here to a lifetime anti-nuclear activist who uh, has served a total of eight years of her life in jail uh, for trespass. And um, her name is Bonnie Erfer, and she's the editor of Nuke Watch. And at the time she wrote what I'm going to quote here, she was uh, serving out an eight-month sentence. She had told the judge in no uncertain terms that he could go stick it. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it, it, the sentence of eight months was retaliatory on this part. Quote, I have worked at Nuke Watch for 25 years and cannot stop working against nuclear power and weapons. I have petitioned, written letters, protested, and gone to jail many times and will again soon for opposing nuclear weapons production at Y-12 complex in Tennessee. That's the complex that gave us Little Boy, which is the Hiroshima bomb. Nonviolent resistance at the risk of arrest and prison is a sane response to a callous government and greedy industry, yet I regret and apologize for not being more effective. I have long thought that politics of the heart have never been able to keep pace with politics of the mind. Imagine what the world would look like if, for the past 50 years, all of the trillions of dollars spent on weapons of mass destruction and nuclear power would have been poured into renewable energy sources instead. Imagine how life-affirming policies could have enhanced worldwide community and relief from the suffering that is continuously caused by war 
and war preparations if instead of politics of the mind focused on domination and profit, we had collectively embraced politics of the heart, focusing on what is best for us all now and future generations. Believe me when I say that those of us who have been doing anti-nuclear work for decades desperately need help. Every person is needed to commit to ending the nuclear age today in our lifetime to lessen the impact on every future generation. There is no other solution. Perhaps it is not given on this earth to learn all the marching steps. And those we have learned, we have not yet learned fast enough, not even close. Now, in the time left to us, at best we can learn to place one foot before another while we fathom the great divide. Why should one man feast while another man starve? Tom Paine asked his question as a great empire writhed in its birth pangs. His sons and daughters, the 99%, are asking it now. What is right? What right have we to do what is right? What right remains to us knowing the little that we know? Setting one foot forward before the other, we will put our solar panels on our roofs. We will drive less or not at all. We will walk a little more. We will learn to share. We will own our workplaces. We will form our state and city banks. We will chain ourselves to reactor gates with our signs and our puppets and our drums and fires. We will risk arrest. We will circulate anti-nuclear ballot initiatives. We will appear in the chambers of our local municipalities and march in the streets. We will speak what words our insect tongues can generate that day. We will live the slow resistances of which we are capable. We are what we are. Sometimes, in times of deep despair, I walk in the forest. I set myself a task. Every tree, every leaf, every flutter of bird wing in the branches, every stone, every pebble in the path, all of these I see, knowing that if I fail to see, that single thing will disappear, will vanish from the earth to be sucked up by nothingness, never to return. Only an exercise, a letting out of the mind's horse from its stable for a slow run in the what if. Will you join me? to invite Pat up here, Pat Hines, to moderate, but I want to uh, say that Nuke Watch is available for free up on the tables here. They sent out uh, copies. Please take, uh, there, it's a quarterly, it comes out four times a year, and we hope you'll subscribe and support them as they support us with information. And um, also, um, there are uh, buttons and bumper stickers. It, I mean, it seems like the least anybody could do is wear this and put your bumper sticker on your car, one dollar each. And also, if you're still driving. If you're still driving. <laughs> and also, if the people at the table there could pass around the sign-up sheet for Nuclear Free Future to be on our email list, please bring, there's two different yellow pads, and print, and also Put down your phone number so if we can't read your email, we can call you and get it. Sign up to be on our list and keep informed. Where is Pat? She, she's oh, she had to leave. I'm sorry. Andrew, what's on your list next? Um, questions and answers. Questions and okay. answers. Okay. Questions and answers. So, 10 minutes. Yeah.
Let's have some questions here. All right. So, um, who'd like to ask a question? We have 10 minutes, so be bold. Yes. Yes, you. All right. Um, we can well, probably hear you if you stand this up. This is more of a practical question, actually. Uh, why don't you come up here? Yeah. Come on. Uh, and use the microphone. So yeah. everybody you might not. You might not be the, the right person. Actually, you might not be the right person to answer this. And that's no offense to you, but maybe there is someone here, more scientific with more scientific knowledge. But I'm worried about my diet because I eat a lot of fish and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I just saw a map of nuclear something radiation coming off of almost to Hawaii at this point. I don't know if anyone else has seen this map. Has anyone else seen this map? So, I mean, how soon would you stop? Now. Now. So, the answer is, um, how soon should you stop eating? <laughs> That's the answer. Because I'm sure you know this, but you have hot spots in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have hot spots on the West Coast. And I have to tell you that uh, this government has been extremely secretive in terms of not wanting you to know and not seeing those pictures of the plumes. They were taken off the internet almost immediately. I know, I saw them. Some of those sites were shut down. However, the Centers for Disease Control let out a certain piece of information that I think is very significant. And that is that in the first three months after Fukushima, infant mortality, that means Deaths of children one year and under, including uh, stillbirths. Infant mortality went up 35%, that's statistically very significant, in eight northwestern cities of the United States. We're talking Portland, Seattle, Berkeley, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, and three others, San Jose being another. Yes? Is um, Santa Cruz one of them? Can you speak a little louder? Is Santa Cruz Santa one of Cruz. them? Santa Cruz. Yes, Santa Cruz is one of them. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> oops. But you know what? We're all in this together, folks. You know? I mean, this is our planet. And guess what? We are the planet. You are the planet. I, we should have a, a John Lennon song. We are the planet, right? Um, because we are. And, we can, and that's why I was so freaked out. I knew that we would be eating it, breathing it. Uh, I knew that we would, it would be in our soils. And as you know, uh, we're still, uh, there's still the imprint of all of the nuclear testing in the Pacific. These, the fallout uh, has a signature. And the signature of the fallout is different uh, of the Pacific testing. That signature of cesium-134 and 137 is different from the signature of the Fukushima fallout. And that's how scientists can know. And if you want to know more about this, you can go to the website of the University of California Department of Nuclear Engineering. They are monitoring uh, soils, air, and milk on the West Coast, and that'll give you some idea. Because fallout does not observe state lines, as you know, and it does not observe nationalities. It is extremely democratic, unlike the nuclear industry, mm -hmm. which is very secretive and top-down. But fallout belongs to all of us. So what can I say? I mean, tonight we had a fantastic dinner, and you can be sure that, you know, it's, it's inevitable. This is a system. This planet is like a womb. And the atmosphere, the air, is like the, the amnion, OK? And uh, when you design, as a brilliant engineer, you design a system that has no cloaca. You know what a cloaca is? OK, in polite company, it's called a cloaca. And in polite company, it's called an asshole. OK, so this is a system with no bathroom. It's a house without a bathroom. So other questions? Yes. Uh, I heard there's, just, on, just recently I was reading that there's uh, both animal uh, deformations and plant deformations in the US and Japan now. Well, I would love to talk to you after and you give me your source, because that's very interesting. We are seeing mutations. There's no question about it. Uh, I was talking uh, earlier uh, to, where are you, doctor? Yes, uh, I was talking earlier about birth deformities. They're not um, defects. We're not talking about ADE. We're talking about, 
human beings, children, babies, born with two sets of legs, for example, or with two heads, or with no head, or with the in, inside of the body, all the organs on the outside of the body. And the parents have to essentially take care of that child in a country, Iraq, where the infrastructure has been bombed. Uh, there's no clean water. Uh, there's no filtration plants to speak of. The very intermittent electricity. No medicines to speak of are very few. So it's, it's the substance of life. It's our, it's our DNA. And every living thing on the planet, okay, every living thing has the same code, the DNA of life. And this technology damages that code for all eternity. So we must work to shut it down because there is no available technology yet to dispose of nuclear waste. And I want briefly to say, I did make contact with a professor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering. I asked for 10 minutes of his time. I told him I wanted to talk to his students. And this is what he said to me. He said, you know what? My position and yours are much more closely aligned than you might imagine, because guess what his area of expertise is? It's nuclear waste, mm -hmm. all right? Um, when I was working on this book, uh, I read a lot, a tremendous number of books and also articles. But the two absolutely most fabulous books that I've read, and I write this down, um, they're fabulous books. One is by an American writer whose name is John Dagata, capital D apostrophe A-G-A-T-A. -A. And it's about Yucca Mountain, and it's called About a Mountain. It's a small book, but oh, is it wise. It's, it is a critique of our particular society, our culture. Can you spell uh, his name again? Yes, John Dagata.